If you're just starting, sure, I wouldn't say jump right to high intensity, but keep in mind that a goal should be to work your way up to be able to perform moderate to high intensity vigorous exercise. Hey everyone, what is the best type of exercise for depression and for anxiety? Thankfully, a recent review helps us to understand what form, meaning cardio, weights, yoga, what intensity, how hard, and what frequency, how often, is the best to improve your mood. So let's unpack this very well-performed umbrella meta-analysis that looked at about 130,000 people and wanted to better understand how can we use exercise to optimize mood. If you've struggled with low mood at points like I have, you'd probably give anything to get out of that low mood because it allows you to really enjoy and engage with life. Uh, so I found this study very interesting, compelling, having a lot of potential utility, so I wanted to share it with you. And they looked at individuals with mild to moderate depression or with anxiety and examined a number of types of exercise, aerobic, strength, even dancing, yoga, mind-body techniques, including Tai Chi and Qigong, and additionally combinations, strength plus aerobic, or a combination of Tai Chi, Qigong, and, and yoga, kind of a mind-body program, if you will. And importantly, they also looked at duration, how long, frequency, how often, and intensity, how hard. And so this begs the question then, what did they find? Well, first, let's start with a high-level sort of meta-conclusion, which is that compared to controls, all forms of exercise were beneficial for anxiety and depression. Probably not super surprising, so let's dig into the details to see how you might be able to fine-tune your exercise so as to have the best impact on your mood. Um, and as we make our way there, I just want to lay this framework of what's happening in the body that improves your mood. Because uh, for people who may not be active enough, understanding some of this may spur you to be a bit more consistent. There's this concept of hormesis or hormetic stressors, that which doesn't kill us makes us stronger. And this seems to apply to cortisol or stress hormone levels. What's interesting from this paper is they found that the acute increases in cortisol that accompany exercise are then followed by lower resting cortisol levels. So what's likely happening, and as this schematic sort of outlines, when your body releases more cortisol, this likely helps attune or train your hypothalamus, which regulates blood cortisol levels and allows it to say, okay, this is a stressful event, exercise, and have a better awareness of your cortisol levels. Then when that stressor is done, actually be able to keep you at a lower resting level of cortisol. And we could use or put up a similar analogy to consider, which would be blood pressure. When you exercise, that acutely increases your blood pressure. But we all know that exercise leads to a blood pressure lowering effect, you know, outside of that exercise um, session. So important to keep in mind the stress hormone cortisol regulatory impacts of exercise. So then how much exercise improves your mood? The most improvements occurred when exercising four to five days per week. This was not more effective than exercising six to seven days per week, which was a little bit surprising to me, but hints at this Goldilocks zone that we see recurring in biology, which is there's a optimal amount. Now regarding intensity, they found that moderate to high intensity was more effective than low intensity. So this is an important point and something to keep in mind that now if you're if you're just starting, sure, I wouldn't say jump right to high intensity, but keep in mind that a goal should be to work your way up to be able to perform moderate to high intensity vigorous exercise. And also coming back to our Goldilocks principle, 30 to 60 minute sessions were actually better than exercising less than 30 minutes or better than exercising more than 60 minutes. So again, this Goldilocks zone seems to be recurring. Something that I really appreciated about a conversation now from a few years ago with 
Dr. Mike T. Nelson, exercise physiologist on our podcast, was when you get to about the hour mark, that is when stress hormones seem to exceed anabolic hormones. So you go into sort of a, a net catabolic state. And that might be part of the reason why we're seeing this 30 to 60 be better than less than 30 and better than more than 60. Now, if you're trying to figure out how do you define intensity, there's a practical aspect where self-reported uh, subjective exertion, right? Um, kind of as hard as you can would be high. Uh, hard, but not totally maxed out would be moderate. And light would be light, right? You're feeling like you're minimally exerted. But you can calculate this with a heart rate chest monitor, you can do a baseline test to calculate first your max heart rate. And then from there, you can calculate your actual zone. Some of the sort of 220 minus age calculations, they give you a, a quasi accurate picture. They're, they're probably best for population based estimates to get you in the ballpark. But there's variability in max heart rate. And if intensity is calculated based upon your max heart rate, then we want to know what that is. So how you can do this, two options here for you, amongst a few others, but I think two easy starting points. The 12-minute Cooper's Run Test. Run as hard and as fast as you can for 12 minutes. Or a 200-meter all-out row. And what you're going to look for when you perform this is what is your max heart rate that was reached during that session, that gives you your max heart rate. Then from there, you can calculate low, moderate, or high intensity by simply multiplying your max heart rate by either 57 to 63 for low, 64 to 76 for moderate, or 77 to 95 for high. So this can help you dial in your um, level of intensity. You do want to be a little bit careful not to always go high. Remember we said moderate to high. If you're a type A like me, you need to be bridled a little bit. And I actually burnt out on going to the high end of the high range every time I exercise. So again, Goldilocks zone, more is not always better. And as an aside here from the same paper, I wanted to quote what I found to be a very insightful piece of information regarding the comparison of exercise to antidepressive medications. Quoting, the effectiveness of exercise for improving depression is similar or slightly greater than medication or psychotherapy. Now, this doesn't mean you have to choose between one or the other, but hopefully to encourage you that if you are struggling with low mood or anxiety, make sure you're exercising four to five days per week 30 to 60 minutes, and at a moderate to high intensity. Now, what is happening? How is it that exercise is helping to improve mood? Well, there's a few mechanisms here. Um, very interestingly, the muscles release this myokine called irisin. In fact, the person who first put this on my radar, thank you, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, made me aware that muscle is a fairly active endocrine organ that secretes inflammatory cytokines of which can be beneficial. So in this case, the, the myokine, you know, similar to a cytokine, uh, has an, an endocrine effect. Uh, so this myokine, irisin, actually has an anti-inflammatory, as you see here with this schematic. Essentially, using your muscles is directly anti-inflammatory through this myokine, irisin. Now, parallel to the anti-inflammatory impacts, there's also these brain effects, which you would expect if you're going to have an impact on anxiety and depression, something's probably going on in the brain. And you may have heard that exercise releases what's known as brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This also happens when you sauna, which might be why sauna has also been shown to have a favorable impact on depression and anxiety. And this brain-derived neurotrophic factor literally leads to better connectivity between neurons and in part of this cascade will increase serotonin and will also increase dopamine and both of the inflammatory modulation and 
uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor modulation has an impact on anxiety and on depression. So hopefully this helps you to see that when you exercise, you're favorably impacting so many systems, your cortisol levels, your inflammation, and directly your neurology. So to tie this all together, we'll break this down to two plans, getting started, and if you're already exercising, how to fine tune. Getting started, we wanna make this simple. Habituation, consistency is the most important factor. Pick your preferred type, start with lower to moderate intensity, and most importantly, be consistent. Now, if you're more of a experienced exerciser, then include both strength and aerobic for balance, meaning a, a balanced stimulus. Remember that strength training will have benefits outside of mood. Namely, as we age, we wanna maintain our fast twitch muscle fibers and our muscle mass and our bone density. So this is where, in my opinion, there's certainly evidence to support this, aerobic or mind-body alone may not be sufficient for optimal health. Aim for four to five days per week, 30 to 60 minutes, and a moderate to high intensity. Again, being careful not to think that high, high intensity every time, all the time is the best. And these recommendations should help steer you toward optimal mood. Now, is this going to apply for all people, all places, all times? No, but it's a starting point for if you're looking for a target in terms of, am I doing too much exercise or too little? And you're trying to optimize your mood. This is a place for us to target, to aim, to give us some guidance. Uh, and great meta-analysis here. Hopefully you found this as compelling as I have and will help you to optimize your mood by fine-tuning your exercise. All right, guys, this is Dr. Michael Ruscio. Talk to you next time.